Two Old Men by Leo Tolstoy The hour was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the town to buy provisions. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew. How can you ask me, a Samaritan, and a woman for a drink? The Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. Jesus replied, if only you recognize God's gift and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him instead, and he would have given you living water. John 4, 6-10 through 10. Chapter 1 Two old men got ready to go to old Jerusalem to pray to God. One of them was a rich peasant. His name was Ephim Tarasik Shevlev. The other was not a well-to-do man, and his name was Elisee Bodro. Ephim was a steady man. He did not drink liquor, nor smoke tobacco, nor take snuff, had never cursed in his life, and was a stern, firm old man. He had served two terms as an elder, and had gone out of his office without a deficit. He had a large family, two sons and a married grandson, and all lived together. As to his looks, he was a sound, bearded, erect man and only in his seventh decade did a gray streak appear in his beard. Elysee was neither wealthy nor poor. In his former days he used to work out as a carpenter. But in his old age he stayed at home and kept bees. One son was away earning money, and another was living at home. Elysee was a good-natured and merry man. He liked to drink liquor and take snuff and sing songs. But he was a peaceable man and lived in friendship with his home folk and with his neighbors. In appearance, he was an undersized, swarthy man with a curly beard and, like his saint, Prophet Elisha, his whole head was bald. The, two, the old men had long ago made the vow and agreed to go together, but Tarasik had had no time before. He had so much business on hand. The moment one thing came to an end, another began. Now he had to get his grandson married. Now he was expecting his younger son back from the army, and now he had to build him a new hut. On a holiday, the two old men once met, and they sat down on logs. Well, said Elisee, when are we going to carry out our vow? Ephem frowned. We shall have to wait, he said, for this is a hard year for me. I have started to build a house. I thought I could do it with one hundred, but it is going now in the third, and still it is not done. We shall have to let it go till summer. In the summer, God willing, we shall go by all means. According to my understanding, said Elysee, there is no sense in delaying. We ought to go at once. Spring is the best time. The time is all right, but the work is begun, so how can I drop it? Have you nobody to attend to it? Your son will do it. Do it. My eldest is not reliable. He drinks. When we die, friend, they will all get along without us. Let your son learn it. That is so. But still, I want to see the things get done under my eyes. Oh, dear man, you can never attend to everything. The other day the women in my house were washing and cleaning up for the holidays. This and that had to be done, and everything could not be looked after. My eldest daughter-in-law, a clever woman, said, It is a lucky thing the holidays come without us, without waiting for us, for else, no matter how much we might work, we should never get done. Tarasik fell to musing. I have spent a great deal of money on this building, he said, and I can't start out on the pilgrimage with empty hands. One hundred rubles are not a trifling matter. Elise laughed. Don't sin, friend, he said. You have ten times as much as I, and yet you talk about money? Only say when we shall start. I have no money, but that will be all right. Tarasik smiled. What a rich man you are, he said. Where shall you get the money from? I will scratch around in the house, and I will get together some there. And if that is not enough, I will let my neighbor have ten hives. He has been asking me for them. You will have a fine swarm. You will be worrying about it. Worrying? No, my friend. I have never worried about anything in life but sins. 
There is nothing more precious than the soul. That is so. But still, it is not good if things do not run right at home. If things do not run right in our soul, it is worse. We have made a vow, so let us go. Truly, let us go. Chapter 2 Elysee persuaded his friend to go. Ephim thought and thought about it, and on following morning he came to Elysee. Well, let us go, he said. You have spoken rightly. God controls life and death. We must go while we are alive and have strength. A week later, the old men started. Tarasik had money at home. He took one hundred rubles with him and left two hundred with his wife. Elysee, too, got ready. He sold his neighbor ten hives and, in, and the increase of ten other hives. For the whole he received seventy rubles. The remaining thirty rubles he swept up from everybody in the house. His wife gave him the last she had. She had put it away for her funeral. His, father, his daughter-in-law gave him what she had. Ephem Tarasik left all his affairs in the hands of his eldest son. He told him where to mow, how many fields to mow, and where to haul the manure, and how to finish the hut and thatch it, he considered everything and gave his orders. But all the order that Elysee gave was that his wife should set out the young brood separate, separately from the hives sold, and give the neighbor what belonged to him without cheating him. But about domestic affairs he did not even speak. The needs themselves, he thought, will show you what you need to do and how to do it. You have been farming yourselves, so you will do as seems best to you. The old men got ready. The home folk baked a lot of flat cakes for them, and they made wallets for themselves, cut out of new leg rags. Put on new short boots, took reserve bast shoes, and started. The home folk saw them off beyond the enclosure and bade them goodbye, and the old men were off for their pilgrimage. Elysee left in a happy mood. And as soon as he left his village, he forgot all his affairs. All the care he had was how to please his companion, how to keep from saying an unseemly word to anybody, how to reach the goal in peace and love, and how to get home again. As Elysee walked along the road, he either muttered some prayer or repeated such of the lives of the saints that he knew. Whenever he met a person on the road, or when he came to a hostelry, he tried to be as kind to everybody as he could and say to them God-fearing words. He walked along and was happy. There was only one thing Elysee could not do. He wanted to stop taking snuff, and he had left his snuff box at home, but he hankered for it. On the road a man offered him some. He wrangled with himself and stepped away from his companion so as not to lead him into sin, and took a pinch. Ephem Tarasik walked firmly and well. He did no wrong and spoke no vain words, but there was no lightness in his heart. The cares about his home did not leave his mind. He was thinking all the time about what was going on at home, whether he had forgotten to give his son some order, and whether his son was doing things the right way. When he saw along the road that they were setting out potatoes or hauling manure, he wondered whether his son was doing as he had been ordered. He just felt like returning and showing him what to do and doing it himself. Chapter 3 The old men walked for live weeks. They wore out their homemade bast shoes and began to buy new ones. They reached the country of the Little Russians. Heretofore they had been paying for their night's lodging and for their dinner, but when they came to the Little, the little Russians, people vied with each other in inviting them in their houses. They let them come in and fed them and took no money from them, but even filled their wallets with bread, and now and then with flat cake. And thus the old men walked without expense for some seven hundred versts. They crossed another government and came to a place where there had been a failure of crop. There they let them into houses and did not take any money for their night's lodging, but would not feed them, and they did not give them bread anywhere. Not even for money could the old men get any in some places. The previous year, so the people said, nothing had grown. Those who had been rich were ruined. They sold everything. Those who had lived in comfort came down to nothing, and the poor people either entirely left the country or turned beggars or just managed to exist at home. 
In the winter, they lived off chaff and oric. One night, the two old men stayed in a burrow. There they bought about fifteen pounds of bread. In the morning they left before daybreak, so that they might walk a good distance before the heat. They marched some ten versts and reached a brook. They sat down, filled their cups with water, softened the bread with it, and ate it, and changed their leg rags. They sat a while and rested themselves. Elisi took out his snuff horn. Ephem Tarsic shook his head. Why don't you throw away that nasty thing, he asked. Elisi waved his hand. It has overpowered me, he said. What shall I do? They walked another ten versts. They came to a large village and passed through it. It was quite warm then. Elisi was tired and wanted to stop and get a drink, but Tarasik would not stop. Tarasik was a better walker, and Elisi had a hard time keeping up with him. I should like to get a drink, he said. Well, drink. I do not want any. Elisi stopped. Do not wait for me, he said. I will just run into a hut and get a drink of water. I will catch up with you at once. All right, he said, and Ephem Tarasik proceeded by himself along the road, while Elisi turned into a hut. Elisi came up to the hut. It was a small clay cabin. The lower part was black, the upper white, and the clay had long ago crumbled off. Evidently it had not been plastered for a long time and the roof was open at one end. The entrance was from the yard. Elisi stepped into the yard, and there saw that a lean, beardless man with his shirt stuck in his trousers in the little Russian fashion was lying near the earth mount. The man had evidently laid down in a cool spot, but now the sun was burning down upon him. He was lying there awake. Elisi called out to him, asking him to give him a drink, but the man made no reply. He is either sick or an unkind man thought Elisi, going up to the door. Inside he heard a child crying. He knocked with the door ring. Good people! No answer. He struck with his staff against the door. Christian people! No stir. Servants of the Lord! No reply. Elisi was on the point of going away when he heard somebody groaning within. I wonder whether some misfortune has happened there to the people. I must see. And Elisi went into the hut. Chapter 4 Elisi turned the ring. The door was not locked. He pushed the door open and walked through the vestibule. The door into the living room was open. On the left there was an oven. Straight ahead was a front corner. In the corner stood a shrine and a table. Beyond the table was a bench and on it sat a bareheaded old woman, in nothing but a shirt. Her head was leaning on the table, and near her stood a lean little boy, his face as yellow as wax, and his belly swollen. And he was pulling the old woman's sleeve, and crying at the top of his voice, and begging for something. Elisi entered the room. There was a stifling air in the house. He saw a woman lying behind the oven, on the floor. She was lying on her face without looking at anything and snoring, and now stretching out a leg and again drawing it up. And she tossed from side to side, and from her came an oppressive smell. Evidently she was very sick, and there was nobody to take her away. The old woman raised her head when she saw the man. What do you want? she said in little Russian. What do you want? We have nothing, my dear man. Elisi understood what she was saying. He walked over to her. Servant of the Lord, he said, I have come in to get a drink of water. There is none, I say, there is none. There is nothing here for you to take. Go. Elisi asked her, Is there no well man here to take this woman away? There is nobody here. The man is dying in the yard, and we here. The boy grew quiet when he saw the stranger, but when the old woman began to speak, he again took hold of her sleeve. Bread, Granny, bread! He burst out weeping. Just as Elisi was going to ask the old woman another question, the man tumbled into the hut. He walked along the wall and wanted to sit down on the bench, but before reaching it, he fell down in the corner 
near the threshold. He did not try to get up, but began to speak. He would say one word at a time, then draw his breath, then say something again. We are sick, he said, and hungry. The boy is starving. He indicated the boy with his head and began to weep. LSD shifted his wallet from his back, freed his arms, let the wallet down on the ground, lifted it onto the bench, and untied it. When it was open, he took out the bread and the knife, cut off a slice, and gave it to the man. The man did not take it, but pointed to the boy and the girl to have it given to them. Elise gave it to the boy. When the boy saw the bread, he made for it, grabbed the slice with both hands, and stuck his nose into the bread. A girl crawled out from behind the oven and gazed at the bread. Elise gave her, too, a piece. He cut off another slice and gave it to the old woman. She took it and began to chew it. If, if you could just bring us some water, she said. Your lips are parched. I wanted to bring some yesterday or, or today. I do not remember when. But I fell down and left the pail there if nobody took it away. Elise asked where their well was. The old woman told him where. Elise went out. He found the pail, brought some water, and gave the people to drink. The children ate some more bread with water, and the old woman ate some, but the man would not eat. My, my stomach will not, will not hold it, he said. The woman did not get up or come to. She was just tossing on the bed place. Elise went to the shop and bought millet, salt, flour, and butter. He found an axe, chopped some wood, and made a fire in the oven. The girl helped him. Elise cooked a soup and porridge and fed the people. Chapter 5 The man ate a little, and so did the old woman, and the girl and the little boy licked the bowl clean and embraced each other and fell asleep. The man and the old woman told Elise how it had all happened. We lived heretofore poorly, they said, but when the crop failed us, we ate, it. we ate up in the fall everything we had. When we had nothing to le left, we began to beg from our neighbors and from good people. At first they gave us some, but later they refused. Some of them would have been willing to give us to eat, but they had nothing themselves. Besides, we felt ashamed to beg. We owed everybody money and flour and bread. I, I looked for work, said the man, but could find none. People, people were everywhere looking for work to get something to eat. One day I would work, and two I would go around looking for more work. The old woman and the girl went a distance away to beg, but the alms were poor. Nobody had any bread. Still we managed to get something to eat. We thought we might squeeze through until the new crop. But in the spring they quit giving us alms altogether, and sickness fell upon us. It grew pretty bad. One day we would have something to eat, and two we went without it. We began to eat grass, and from the grass, or from some other reason, the woman grew sick. She lay down, and I had no strength, and we had nothing from which to improve matters. I was the only one, the old woman said, who worked, but I gave out and grew weak as I had nothing to eat. The girl, too, grew weak and lost her courage. I sent her to the neighbors, but she did not go. She hid herself in a corner and would not go. A neighbor came in two days ago, but when she saw that we were hungry and sick, she turned around and went out. Her husband has left, and she has nothing with which to feed her young children, so we were lying here and waiting for death. When Elise heard what they had said, he changed his mind about catching up with his companion and remained there overnight. In the morning, Elise got up and began to work about the house as though he were the master. He set bread with the old woman and made fire in the oven. He went out. He went with the girl to the neighbors to fetch what was necessary. Everything he wanted to pick up was gone, 
There was nothing left for farming, and the clothes were used up. Elsie got everything which was needed. Some things he made himself, and some he bought. Elsie stayed with them one day, and a second, and a third. The little boy regained his strength, and he began to walk on the bench and to make friends with Elsie. The girl, too, became quite cheerful and helped him in everything. She kept running after Elsie. Grandfather, grandfather! The old woman got up and went to her neighbor. The man began to walk by holding on the wall. Only the woman was lying down. On the third day, she came to and asked for something to eat. Well, thought Elsie, I had not expected to lose so much time. Now I must go. Chapter 6 The fourth day was the last of a fast, and Elsie said to himself, I will break the fast with them. I will buy something for them for the holidays, and in the evening I must leave. Elsie went once more to the village and bought milk, white flour, and lard. He and the old woman cooked and baked a lot of things, and in the morning Elsie went to Mass and came back and broke fast with the people. On that day the woman got up and began to move about. The man shaved himself, put on a clean shirt the old woman had washed it for him, and went to a rich peasant to ask a favor of him. His mowing and field were mortgaged to the rich man, so he went to ask him to let him have the mowing in the field until the new crop. He came back gloomy in the evening and burst out weeping. The rich man would not show him the favor. He had asked him to bring the money. Elsie fell to musing. How are they going to live now? People will be going out to mow, but they cannot go, for it is all mortgaged. The rye will ripen, and the people will begin to harvest it. And there is such a fine stand of it, but they will have nothing to look forward to. Their desyathina is sold to the rich peasant. If I go away, they will fall back into poverty. And Elsie was in doubt, and he did not go away in the evening, but put it off until the morning. He went into the yard to sleep. He said his prayers and lay down but he could not fall asleep. I ought to go. As it is, I have spent much time here and money. But I am sorry for the people. You can't help everybody. I meant to bring them some water and give them each a slice of bread, but see how far I have gone? Now I shall have to buy out his mowing and field. And if I buy out the field, I might as well buy a cow for the children and a horse for the man to haul his sheaves with. Brother Elsie Kuzmich, you are in for it. You have let yourself loose, and now you will not straighten out things. Elsie got up, took the kaftan from under his head, and unrolled it. He drew out his snuff horn and took a pinch, thinking that it would clear his thoughts. But no. He thought and thought and could not come to any conclusion. He ought to get up and go, but he was sorry for the people. He did not know what to do. He rolled up the kaftan under his head and lay down to sleep. He lay there for a long time, and the cocks crowed, and then only did he fall asleep. Suddenly he felt as though someone had wakened him. He saw himself all dressed with his wallet and staff, and he had to pass through a gate, but it was just open enough to let a man squeeze through. He went to the gate, and his wallet caught on one side, and as he was about to free it, one of his leg rags got caught on the other side and came open. He tried to free the leg rag, but it was not caught in a wicker fence. It was the girl who was holding on to it and crying, Grandfather, Grandfather Bread! He looked at his foot, and there was a little boy holding on to it, and the old woman and the man were looking out the window. Elsie awoke, and he began to speak to himself in an audible voice. I will buy out the field and the mowing tomorrow and will buy a horse and flour to last until harvest time, and a cow for the children. For how would it be to go beyond the sea, to seek Christ, and lose him within me? I must get these people started. And Elsie fell asleep until morning. He awoke early, and went to the rich merchant, bought out the rye, and gave him money for the mowing. He bought a scythe, for that had been sold too, and brought it home. He sent the man out to mow, and himself went to see the peasants. He found a horse and a cart for sale at the innkeepers, 
He bargained with him for it and bought it. Then he bought a bag of flour, which he put in the cart, and he went out to buy a cow. As he was walking, he came across two little Russian women, and they were talking to one another. Though they were talking in their dialect, he could make out what they were saying about him. You see, at first they did not recognize him. They thought he was just a simple kind of man. They say he went in to get a drink, and he had just stopped there. What a lot of things he has bought them. I myself saw him buy a horse and a cart today of the innkeeper. Evidently there are such people in the world. I must go and take a look at him. When Elysee heard that, he understood that they were praising him, and so he did not go buy the cow. He returned to the innkeeper and gave him money for the horse. He hitched it up and drove with the flower to the house. When he drove up to the gate, he stopped and climbed down from the cart. When the people of the house saw the horse, they were surprised. They thought that he had bought the horse for them, but did not dare say so. The master came out to open the gate. Grandfather, where did you get that horse? I bought it, he said. I got it cheap. Mow some grass and put it in the cart so that the horse may have some for the night, and take off the bag. The master unhitched the horse, carried the bag to the granary, mowed a lot of grass, and put it into the cart. They lay down to sleep. Elysee slept in the street, and thither he had carried his wallet in the evening. All the people fell asleep. Elysee got up, tied his wallet, put on his shoes and his caftan, and started down the road to catch up with Ephem. Chapter 7 Elysee had walked about five versts when the day began to break. He sat down under a tree, untied his wallet, and began to count his money. He found that he had seventeen rubles, twenty kopecks left. Well, he thought, with this sum, I cannot travel beyond the sea. But if I beg in Christ's name, I shall only increase my sin. Friend Ephem will reach the place by himself, and will put up a candle for me. But I shall evidently never fulfill my vow. The master is merciful, and he will forgive me. Elsie got up, slung his wallet over his shoulders, and turned back. He made a circle around the village so that the people might not see him, and soon he reached home. On his way, he had found it hard. It was hard keeping up with Ephem. But on his way home, God made it easy for him, for he did not know what weariness was. Walking was just a play to him, and he swayed his staff. He made as much as seventy versts a day. Elsie came back home. The harvest was all in. The home folk were glad to see the old man. They asked all about him, why he had left his companion and why he had not gone to Jerusalem, but had returned home. Elysee did not tell them anything. God did not grant me that I should, he said. I spent my money on the way, got separated from my companion, and so I did not go. Forgive me, for Christ's sake. He gave the old woman what money he had left. He asked all about the home matters. Everything was right. Everything had been attended to and nothing missed, and all were living in peace and agreement. Ephem's people heard that very day that Elysee had come back, and so they came to inquire about their old man, and Elysee told them the same story. You see, he said, the old man started to walk briskly, and three days before St. Peter's Day we lost each other. I wanted to catch up with him, but it happened that I spent all my money and could not go on, so I returned home. The people marveled how it was that such a clever man had acted so foolishly as to start out and not reach the place and merely spend his money. They wondered a while and forgot about it. Elysee, too, forgot about it. He began to work about the house. He got the wood ready for winter with his son, threshed the grain with the women, thatched the sheds, gathered in the bees, and gave ten hives with the young brood to his neighbor. When he got all the work done, he sent his son out to earn money and himself sat down in the winter to plate bast shoes and hollow out locks for the hive. Chapter 8 All that day that Elysee passed with the sick people, Ephem waited for his companion. He walked but a short distance and sat down. He waited and waited and fell asleep. When he awoke, he sat a while, but his companion did not turn up. He kept a sharp lookout for him, but the sun was going down behind a tree and still Elysee was not there. I wonder whether he has not passed by me, he thought. Maybe somebody drove him past, and he did not see me while I was asleep. But how could he help seeing me? 
in the steppe you can see a long distance off. If I go back, he may be marching on, and we shall only get further separated from each other. I will walk on. We shall meet at the resting place for the night. When he came to a village, he asked the village officer to look out for an old man and bring him to the house where he stayed. Elsie did not come there for the night. Ephem marched on and asked everybody whether they had seen a bald-headed old man. No one had seen him. Ephem was surprised and walked on. We shall meet somewhere in Odessa, he thought, or on the boat. And then he stopped thinking about it. On the road he fell in with a pilgrim. The pilgrim, in Kalat, Cossack, and long hair, had been to Mount Athos and was now going for the second time to Jerusalem. They met at a hostelry, and they had a chat and started off together. They reached Odessa without any accident. They waited for three days for a ship. There were many pilgrims there, and they had come together from all directions. Again, Ephem asked about Elisee, but nobody had seen him. Ephem provided himself with a passport. It cost five rubles. He had forty rubles left for his round trip, and he bought bread and herring for the voyage. The ship was loaded. Then the pilgrims were admitted, and Tarsik sat down beside the pilgrim he had met. The anchors were weighed, they pushed off from the shore, and the ship sailed across the sea. During the day they had good sailing. In the evening a wind arose, rain fell, and the ship began to rock and be washed by the wave. The people grew excited. The women began to shriek, and such men as were weak ran up and down the ship trying to find a safe place. Ephem too was frightened. But he did not show it. Where he sat down on the floor on the boarding ship by the side of Tombov peasants, he sat through the night and the following day. All of them held on to their wallets and did not speak. On the third day, it grew calmer. On the fifth day, they landed at Constantinople. Some of the pilgrims went ashore there to visit the Cathedral of St. Sophia, which now the Turk told. Tarasik did not go, but remained on board the ship. All he did was to buy some white bread. They remained there a day, and then again sailed through the sea. They stopped at Smyrna town, and at another city by the name of Alexandria, and safely reached the city of Jaffa. In Jaffa all pilgrims go ashore. From there it is seventy versts on foot to Jerusalem. At the landing the people had quite a scare. The ship was high, and the people were let down onto boats below. But the boats were rocking all the time, and two people were let down past the boat and got a dunking. But otherwise all went safely. When all were ashore, they went on foot. On the third day they reached Jerusalem at dinner time. They stopped in a suburb, in a Russian hostelry. There they had their passports stamped and ate their dinner, and then they followed a pilgrim to many holy places. It was too early yet to be admitted to the sepulchre of the Lord, so they went to the monastery of the Patriarch, where all the worshippers were gathered, and the female sex was put apart from the male. They were all ordered to take off their shoes and sit in a circle, and a monk came out with a towel and began to wash everybody's feet. He would wash and rub them clean and kiss them, and thus he went around the whole circle. He washed Ephem's feet and kissed them. They were celebrated vigils and matines, and placed a candle and served a mass for the parents, and there they were fed and received wine to drink. On the following morning, they went to the cell of Mary of Egypt, where she took refuge. There, there they placed the candles, and a mass was celebrated. From there they went to Abraham's monastery. They saw the Sebach Garden, the place where Abraham wanted to sacrifice his son to God. Then they went to the place where Christ appeared to Mary Magdalene, and to the church of Jacob, the brother of the Lord. The pilgrims showed them all the places, and in every place he told just how much money they ought to give. At dinner they returned to the hostelry. They ate and were just getting ready to lie down to sleep when the pilgrim, who was rummaging through his clothes, began to sigh. <sighs> they had pulled my, out my pocketbook with money in it, he said. I had twenty-three rubles. Two ten-ruble bills and three in chain. The pilgrim felt badly about it but nothing could be done, and all went to sleep. Chapter 9 As Ephem went to sleep, a temptation came over him. 
They have not taken the pilgrim's money, he thought. He did not have any. Nowhere did he offer anything. He told me to give, but he himself did not offer any. He took a ruble from me. As Ephem was thinking, so he began to rebuke himself. How dare I judge the man and commit a sin? I will not sin. The moment he forgot himself, he again thought that the pilgrim had a sharp eye on money and that it was unlikely that they had taken any money from him. He never had any money, he thought. It's only an excuse. They got up before evening and went to an early mass at the Church of the Resurrection, to the sepulcher of the Lord. The pilgrim did not leave Ephem's side, but walked with him all the time. They came to the church. There was there collected a large crowd of worshippers, Greeks and Armenians and Turks and Syrians. Ephem came with the people to the holy gate. A monk led them. He took them past the Turkish guard to the place where the Savior was taken from the cross and anointed, and where candles were burning in nine large candlesticks. He showed and explained everything to them. Ephem placed a candle there. Then the monks led Ephem to the right, over the steps to Golgotha, where the cross stood. There Ephem prayed. Then Ephem was shown the cleft where the earth was rent to the lowermost regions. Then he was shown the place where Christ's hands and feet had been nailed to the cross. And then he was shown Adam's grave, where Christ's blood dropped on his bones. Then they came to the rock on which Christ sat when they put the wreath of thorns on his head. Then to the post to which Christ was tied when he was beaten. Then Ephem saw the stone with the two holes for Christ's feet. They wanted to show him other things, but the people hastened away. All hurried to the grotto of the Lord's Sepulchre. Some foreign mass was just ended, and the Russian began. Ephem followed the people to the grotto. He wanted to get away from the pilgrim, for in thought he still sinned against him. But the pilgrim stuck with him, and went with him to the mass at the Sepulchre of the Lord. They wanted to stand close to it, but were too late. There was such a crowd there it was not possible to move forward or back. Ephem stood there and looked straight ahead and prayed, but every once in a while he felt for his purse to see whether it was in his pocket. His thoughts were divided. Now he thought that the pilgrim had deceived him, and then he thought, if he had not deceived him and the pocketbook had really been stolen, the same might happen to him. Chapter 10 Ephem stood there and prayed and looked ahead into the chapel where the sepulchre itself was, and where over the sepulchre thirty-six lamps were burning. Ephem looked over the heads to see the marvelous thing. Under the very lamps, where the blessed fire was burning, in front of all, he saw an old man in a coarse coffin, with a bald spot shining on his whole head, and he looked very much like Elisi Bodrov. He resembles Elisi, he thought. But how could it be? He could not have got here before me. The previous ship started a week ahead of us. He could not have been on that ship. On our ship he was not, for I saw all the pilgrims. Just as Ephem was thinking this, the old man began to pray and made three bows, once in front of him, to God, and twice to either side, to all the Orthodox people. And as the old man turned his head to the right, Ephem recognized him. Sure enough, it was Bodrov. It was his blackish curly beard and the gray streak on his cheeks, and his brows, his eyes, his nose, and full face, all his. Certainly it was he, Elisi Bodrov. Ephem was glad that he had found his companion, and he marveled how Elisi could have got there ahead of him. How in the world did Bodrov get to this place in front, he thought. No doubt he met a man who knew how to get him there. When all go out, I will hunt him up, and I will drop the pilgrim in the collet, and will walk with him. Maybe he will take me to the front place. Ephem kept an eye on Elisi, so as not to lose him. When the masses were over, the people began to stir. As they went up to kiss the sepulchre, they crowded and pushed Ephem to one side. He was frightened, lest his purse should be stolen. He put his hand to his purse and tried to make his way out into the open. When he got out, he walked and walked, trying to find Elisi, both on the outside and in the church. In the church he saw many people in the cells, 
Some ate and drank wine and slept there and read their prayers, but Elysee was not to be found. Ephem returned to the hostelry, but he did not find his companion there either. On that evening the pilgrim, too, did not come back. He was gone and had not returned the rouble to Ephem, so Ephem was left alone. On the following day Ephem went again to the sepulchre of the Lord with a Tombov peasant with whom he had journeyed on the ship. He wanted to make his way to the front, but again he was pushed back, and so he stood at the column and prayed. He looked ahead of him, and there in front, under the lamps at that very sepulchre of the Lord, stood Elysee. He had extended his hands like a priest at an altar, and the bald spot shone over his whole head. Now, thought Ephem, I will not miss him. So he made his way to the front, but Elysee was not there. Evidently he had left. On the third day he again went to the sepulchre of the Lord, and there he saw Elysee standing in the holiest place, in sight of everybody, and his hands were stretched out, and he looked up, as though he saw something above him and his bald spot shone over his whole head. Now, thought Ephem, I will certainly not miss him. I will go and stand at the entrance, and then he cannot escape me. Ephem went out and stood there for a long time. He stood until afternoon. All the people had passed out, but Elysee was not among them. Ephem passed six weeks in Jerusalem and visited all the places. Bethlehem and Bethany and the Jordan, and had a stamp put on a new shirt at the Lord's sepulchre to be buried in it, and filled a bottle of Jordan water, and got some earth and candles with blessed fire, and in eight places inscribed names for the mass of the dead. He spent all his money and had just enough left to get home on, and so he started for home. He reached Jaffa, boarded a ship, landed at Odessa, and walked towards his home. Chapter 11 Ephem walked by himself the same way he had come out. As he was getting close to his village, he began to worry again about how things were going at home without him. In a year, he thought, much water runs by. It takes a lifetime to get together a home, but it does not take long to ruin it. He wondered how his son had done without him, how the spring had opened, how the cattle had wintered, and whether the hut was well built. Ephem reached the spot where the year before he had partnered with Elysee. It was not possible to recognize the people. Where the year before they had suffered want, now there was plenty. Everything grew well in the field. The people picked up again and forgot their former misery. In the evening, Ephem reached the very village where the year before Elysee had fallen behind. He had just entered the village when a little girl in a white shirt came running out of a hut. Grandfather, grandfather, come to our house. Ephem wanted to go on, but the girl would not let him. She took hold of his coat and laughed and pulled him to the hut. A woman with a boy came out on the porch, and she too beckoned to him. Come in, grandfather, and eat supper with us, and stay overnight. Ephem stepped in. I can, at least, ask about Elysee, he thought. This is the very hut into which he went to get a drink. Ephem went inside. The woman took off his wallet, gave him water to wash himself, and seated him at the table. She fetched milk, cheese, cakes, and porridge, and placed it all on the table. Tarasik thanked her and praised the people for being hospitable to pilgrims. The woman shook her head. We cannot help receiving pilgrims, she said. We received life from a pilgrim. We lived forgetting God, and God punished us in such a way that all of us were waiting for death. Last summer... We came to such a point that we were all lying down sick and starved. We should have certainly died, but God sent us an old man like you. He stepped in during the daytime to get a drink. When he saw us, he took pity on us and remained at our house. He gave us to eat and to drink and put us on our feet again. He cleared our land from debt and bought a horse and a cart and left it with us. The old woman entered the room and interrupted her speech. We do not know, she said, whether he was a man or an angel of the Lord. He was good to us all, and pitied us, and then went away without giving his name, so we do not know for whom to pray to God. I see it as though it happened just now. I was lying down and waiting for death to come. I looked up and saw a man come in, just a simple bald-headed man, and ask for a drink. I, sinful woman, thought that he was a tramp, but see what he did. 
When he saw us, he put down his wallet right in this spot and opened it. The girl broke in. No, Granny, she said. First he put his wallet in the middle of the room, and only later did he put it on the bench. As they began to dispute and to recall his words and deeds, where he sat down and where he had slept, and what he had done and what he had said to each. Toward evening the master of the house came home on a horse, and he too began to tell about Elsie and how he stayed at their house. If he had not come to us, we should have all died in sin. We were dying in despair, and we murmured against God and men. But he put us on our feet, and through him we found God and began to believe in good people. May Christ save him. Before that we lived like beasts, and he has made men of us. They gave Ephem to eat and to drink, and gave him a place to sleep, and themselves went to bed. As Ephem lay down, he could not sleep, and Elysee did not leave his mind, but he thought of how he had seen him three times in Jerusalem, in the foremost place. So this is the way he got ahead of me, he thought. My work may be accepted or not, but his the Lord has accepted. In the morning, Ephem bade the people goodbye. They filled his wallet with cakes and went to work, while Ephem started out on the road. Chapter 12 Ephem was away precisely a year. In the spring he returned home. He reached his house in the evening. His son was not at home. He was in the dram shop. He returned intoxicated, and Ephem began to ask him about the house. He saw by everything the lad had got into bad ways without him, had spent all the money, and the business he had neglected. His father scolded him, and he answered his father with rude words. You ought to have come back yourself, he said. Instead, you went away and took all the money with you, and now you make me responsible. The old man became angry and beat his son. The next morning, Ephem Teresek went to the elder to talk to him about his son. As he passed Elysee's farm, Elysee's wife was standing on the porch and greeting him. Welcome, friend, she said. Did you, dear man, have a successful journey? Ephem Tarasik stopped. Thank God, he said. I have been at Jerusalem, but I lost your husband on the way. I hear that he is back. And the old woman started to talk to him, for she was fond of babbling. He is back, my dear. He has been back for quite a while. He returns soon after Assumption Day. We were so glad to see him back. It was lonely without him. Not that we mean his work, for he is getting old. But he is the head, and it is jollier for us. How happy our lad was. Without him, he said, it was as without light for the eyes. It was lonely without him, my dear. We love him so much. Well, is he home now? At home he is, neighbor, in the apiary, brushing the swarms. He says it was fine swarming season. The old man does not remember when there has been such a lot of bees. God gives us not according to our sins, he says. Come in, dear. He will be so glad to see you. Ephem walked through the vestibule and through the yard to the apiary to see Elysee. When he came inside the apiary, he saw Elysee standing without a net, without gloves, in a gray caftan under a birch tree, extending his arms and looking up, and his bald spot shone over his whole head just as he had stood in Jerusalem at the Lord's sepulchre, and above him, through the birch tree, the sun glowed, and above his head the golden bees circled in the form of a wreath, and did not sting him. Ephem stopped. Elysee's wife called out to her husband, Your friend is here. Elysee looked around. He was happy, and walked over towards his friend, softly brushing the bees out of his beard. Welcome, friend, welcome, dear man. Did you have a successful journey? My feet took me there, and I have brought you some water from the river Jordan. Come and get it. But whether the Lord has received my work... Thank God. Christ save you. Ephraim was silent. I was there with my feet, but in spirit you were there, or somebody else. It is God's work, my friend. God's work. On my way home I stopped at the hut where I lost you. Alice was frightened. He hastened to say, it is God's work, my friend, God's work. Well, won't you step in? I will bring some honey. And Elise changed the subject and began to speak of home matter. Ephraim heaved a sigh. He 
he did not mention the people of the hut to Elisee, nor what he had seen in Jerusalem. And he understood that God has enjoined that each man shall before his death carry out his vow with love and good deeds. The End Hey, if you made it this far, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the content. Look forward to putting more things out very soon. Um, you can also check me out at Davit Kinch for some of my original works, some poetry, short fiction. There's also book reviews coming out very soon. More content is always coming, so hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, notifications, and comment be below. Thank you and God bless.